field. We step on the field looking to do- step on the field looking to dominate. Family three, family three, one, two, three. Pillar to forty, pillar to thirty, pillar cuts up to the pillar cuts up to the twenty-five twenty. It's all about the U, and the U for us is unique. It's it's truly a unique experience here at the University of Miami. This is truly a, a family. It was built uh, on humble beginnings. It was built with a hunger. It was built with a toughness. It was built with an attitude. And as they like to say in the 305 year, they invented swagger. Good evening, sports fans, and welcome to the inaugural radio show for Kane Insider, where we're going to be giving you cutting-edge information, late-breaking news, and all things from the Canes. And it's nothing but the you for this hour, so sit back and relax, and if there's anything that piques your interest, um, call in and give us a shout-out because we want to keep this thing going. Uh, my name is Blaine D. I'm the host of uh, Kane Insider Radio, and the, uh, the uh, man of the hour of the show is Jay Miz. Jay Miz is going to be fielding your calls and talking uh, Kane's, Kane's Insider with you for the next hour. Uh, what we're going to do right now is we're going to talk a little bit about the hot topic of the day, and I'm not talking about Peyton Manning and the Dolphins. I'm talking about Hurricanes Pro Day. That's what we want to hear about. We want to know what kind of results are soon to be drafted ex Kane players have done and accomplished today, and we have a special guest that's going to assist Jay Miz. Jay Miz, it's all yours, brother. Thank you, Blaine, and good evening, Canes fans. This is Jay Miz, and it's great to be on the radio. As a University of Miami alum and a Kane homer, it's my pleasure to host Kane Insider. And as Blaine just said, the topic of the day right now is Pro Day at from Green Tree Field. And what's great is we have insight from our senior editor from Kane Insider, Brandon Adoy. Brandon, are you there? Hey, what's going on, Jay Miz? How are you, Brandon? Well, obviously a busy day at Green Tree, obviously a busy day all around at the University of Miami, and it's a great pleasure to talk about uh, some Kane, you know, Kane underclassmen and some seniors that have contributed over the last few years that will make their splash into, uh, into the NFL. So with that said, why don't you talk us through a little bit about how the day lined up, uh, what insight, what kind of caught you today that shows this class may be different from other classes in years past. Well, the day was pretty interesting. You had, of course, uh, 32 teams, 32 NFL teams that were all gathered on Green Tree Field to check out the Miami Hurricanes, the aspirant class for the uh, NFL draft coming up in April. And so it's it's very rare that you see this. This probably only happens a couple of places uh, across the country. You have uh, – one representative at least from every NFL team, and they all flock to Green Tree to see the Miami Hurricanes work out. Off the top, you've got to know that Lamar Miller, Tommy Streeter, Travis Benjamin, and Olivier Vernon were the people who were garnering the most interest from NFL scouts. Now, the person who absolutely stole the show, in my opinion, was Travis Benjamin. He came in after uh, running an excellent combine time, uh, sub-435, and it was a scenario where all he could do is improve upon that, and he did exactly that. He looked very good in the passing drills, had very good agility, the L cone drills there. And it was a scenario where when I talked to scouts after the pro day workouts were over, Travis Benjamin was the name that kept coming up from those folks who said, now they've got to go back because he looks so good. And look at his tape again. He's a guy that didn't drop any balls. He looked very fast in and out of his routes, and very fluid. So it's a scenario where he got a little bit more interest than he came into the day in, and that's what Pro Day is all about, Jay Miz. Right. Well, that's that's some great insight. You know, he had a rough outing. Obviously, he did great in the 40 time um, up in Indianapolis. But as you know, uh, there was a lot – he dropped – I think he dropped about three balls uh, thrown to him, and that obviously was very discouraging – uh, from the scouts. So for him to make such a quick adjustment, uh, was it anything that you could, that you knew that he did differently? Has he been doing, you know, is, you know, practicing a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, getting up to geared up for today? Or was it just a bad, um, bad trip to Indianapolis that he was able to turn around today at Green Tree? 
Well, Jay Miz, I think it's just one of those things where he was on his home field, his home turf, you know, catching passes from his good pal, Ja'Cory Harris, played four with, years with him here at the U, and it was a scenario where, you know, he just was in his comfort zone and he was doing what he's been known to do. If you watch him this past year, um, he wasn't a feature guy in the offense, but he was a guy who was pretty sure-handed. Jetfish was uh, uh, very prone to get him into these bubble screens and, and try to utilize his speed. He did a couple of deep routes. He dropped one very notable ball from Sean Morris uh, in a game late in the season, and that's something that a lot of people thought, well, wow, you know, he really should have had that pass, but he doesn't have the drops. He's not a guy that's uh, uh, someone you worry about, about catching the ball. Really, none of the Hurricane receivers are, with the exception of maybe LaRon Bird in years past this year. In the limited time he had, he cleaned some of that up. But I think it was just for him, he just had more familiar surroundings. He came out poised, and he was ready to go. Now, Jay Miz will also want to bring you up to speed on the other performers. Obviously, Lamar Miller, who's garnering the most interest for possibly a first-round, second-round pick. He came out and impressed uh, lots of people. Uh, came away with continually good impressions of him. He caught a lot of balls out of the backfield. He did not drop any passes. Uh, looked very fast and quick in those agility cone drills, those 20-yard shuttle numbers he kept, and the 40-yard numbers he kept from the combine. But he did show, you know, what people want to see. So it's going to come down to just what team likes him more. Because when you're looking in the, the end of that third round, the beginning of that second round, you know, you've got the Oregon running back. You've got the Virginia Tech running back, David Wilson. And it's one of those scenarios which, you know, who falls in, who the falls in love with Lamar Miller the most. And so there was only one head coach there. You had a lot of position coaches, tons of scouts. It remains to be seen what conclusions they draw. Well, that was my next thing because Lamar Miller's, you know, there was the report that came out from Tom McShay. And if, if you want to dial in to Canaan Insider Online, uh, make sure to call into the radio show at 323 323- 7849696 and get insight from our senior editor Kane Insider Brandon Adoy along with my co-host uh, Blaine D. Uh Brandon something that was interesting about the McShay report was is that he felt nobody in the nobody at the University of Miami would go in the first round. And this is where although I went, you know, I, I am a uh, Lamar Miller homer obviously with the University of Miami tie. I also did go to Miami Killian and um, I, I got to tell you, this guy is, is wow. So you really are a Lamar Miller guy. <laughs> yeah, I am. A, I really am. Me, me, Randall Hill, and Lamar Miller. Uh, the difference is, is those guys can run about a uh, hundred times faster than I can, and probably uh, and probably do a lot better than you know in any athletic uh, ability that I would have. But with that said, you know, I look at Lamar Miller, and one thing I noticed this year is is that granted we have Coach Kehoe that has come back. And Coach Kehoe is, is, was obviously a staple to the University of Miami. Obviously, many years of some wonderful running backs, along with former coach, uh, running back coach uh, Don Sollinger. But, you know, with, with, with Lamar, he took advantage of, a, of an offensive line that wasn't the, probably the best ever to play at the University of Miami. I mean, granted, you had some seniors coming back, you know, Tyler Horn and those guys, and obviously those guys were out for pro day as well. But the thing with Lamar that I noticed, and, and Blaine, you know, Blaine D, please, you know, chime in. I think the game we saw, the Kansas State game, once he was able to hit the hole, the guy seemed like he was so much faster than everybody else. And I just wanted to get your insight. How do you deny that translating to a first-round pick in, 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 in the NFL draft? It's very difficult given, you know, granted the, the kid coming out of Virginia Tech, but I really like his chances. And, and that's interesting that McShay, McShay would come out with that report. Well, I'm, I'm not sure uh, what McShay bases his uh... – projections on, uh, by and large, McShay and also Mel Kuyper tend to be um, not very right. Uh, they get about five or six uh, right in the first round pretty much on average every year, and uh, you're never really sure what's going to happen. I mean, those guys were both projecting Brandon Harris to be uh, even potentially in the late first round last year. Brandon Harris slipped all the way to the third. So you never really know. I think the thing with Lamar Miller is, The first thing everybody says is, man, he's fast. The second thing is I think he showed that he was a lot tougher uh, than the average back uh, based on the fact that Coach Golden, I think he started buying into the fact that, hey, I don't need to do so much dancing. I need to actually run around and, and, and run straight into the tackles 
and it's a scenario where, hey, you know, I can prove that I can run in between the tackles and run outside. And it's just one of those scenarios where, you know, it is what it is, and now I feel as if he's done that, he's shown that. And like you said, Coach Keogh's offensive line, the success that they had, um, that probably didn't hurt matters as well. Well, you, you know, know it's uh, go ahead. I was just going to chime in there, Jay. Uh, uh, Lamar Miller is not a little guy. I mean, he weighed in at 212, which is not small in terms of the speed that he generated, which he had the official time that was the fastest in the combine at 4-4 four, four, four flat. And the one thing you noticed about Lamar, if you give him a crease, he can take it to the house. And that is very, very coveted in the pros because they're not running through gaping holes all game long. They have limited opportunities, and they have to maximize those opportunities. Absolutely. He's a home run guy, and that's something that you can't buy. If a guy's fast, you can't coach it. And so that's one of the things that excites scouts, and uh, that was some of the word that we got after the workouts today. Well, you know, it's interesting you talk about speed, and, and he wasn't the fastest guy today. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about Lee Chambers, who actually posted the the fastest forty time today? Is this going to be the uh, is this going to be the Sam Shields of this year's class, Brandon? Well, you know, you bring up an interesting point, Jamie. Is I mean, the reality of the situation is now every time you look to Coral Gables and you look at a graduating class, you may not see this under Al Golden as much, but definitely under the the Randy Shannon years, you got a guy like Lee Chambers who hadn't played a lot of cornerback, gets switched to the position, uh, has a lot of intangibles, speed being one, his vertical was 40.5. That was absolutely off the charts. They go back, and, and, and some NFL scout may say, hey, this guy has things we can't teach. He knows a little bit about the position. Let's bring him in on a free agent contract and see if he can't perform and make this team. And, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if this whole Sam Shields thing uh, happens. Now, the, the only reason that I would say uh, I would measure and dial that back some on Chambers, who by far had the best of any uh, lower name or, or, or second or third tier uh, pro aspirant today, uh, the thing about him, I've seen him play in all-star games. I was at the Battle of Florida when he played uh, with other high uh, college all-stars. Uh, who weren't invited to, like, the, the Blue Gray game, the Senior Bowl, and things of that nature. And he still didn't look as impressive as maybe a teammate like Mike Williams, who probably had a, a, a slightly better game. But it doesn't mean that he's not a guy who can learn that position and somebody may take a flyer on him. Because if you think about it, and, and Jamie, as you know this, he was a running back for the majority of his career, you know? Right, right. And so it's a scenario where, listen, Somebody may say, hey, he's had almost no time. A guy like Mike Williams has played cornerback his entire career, you know, and even got a red shirt freshman year to practice with it. Chambers hasn't had much. These intangibles are off the chain. Why don't we yeah, take a look at him? So it wouldn't surprise me that he becomes a Sam Shields, DeMarcus Van Dyke type because look at DVD. DVD's Miami career was not really deserving of a third-round grade, but he got picked up very early in the NFL draft. Well, you talk about you talk about two regimes, right? You talked about the Randy Shannon regime, and unfortunately, that seemed to be the case. And Golden came on the air. I don't know if you got a chance to listen to it on QAM earlier this week, but he talked with, with uh, Joe Rose in depth, and he talked about and, and Blaine Dean and I had been talking about it in, into the lead up of the show. The University of Miami in the last five to six years has produced great, great talent that has gone into the NFL. You had guys like Devin Hester, you have Greg Olson. Uh, you have Winslow. These guys were great. They were great at the. They were okay at the collegiate level. Despite you know, Hester had some some spot moments. He did really well in the punt return, and Winslow with a few great catches. But you take a kid like Greg Olson, that you look at him and you're so disappointed because he did really contributed nothing. Uh, I can think of somebody that may be going into the draft or at least free agency. Chase Ford reminds me of that. What What is the difference this year? You talked about it just now, and if you could touch a base a little bit more about it. What do you think is going to be different for next – what would you anticipate, not to get off onto to next year, because I still want to talk about today's pro day, but what do you anticipate under the, under the golden regime, how these kids will perform differently? Because right now it seems like the University of Miami is simply just a platform to go to the next level. You can play average here, be half-hearted, 
maybe show up, you know, at least putting on the uniform and going through the motions. But how how does that change, Brandon? What is Coach Golden assuring? Because the talk is the talk, it's the walk is the walk. So tell me a little bit what what your feel was today at Pro Day. Well, I think that what you're going to see is, first of all, guys are going to be a lot stronger under the Golden Regime. Starting immediately next year, all the guys that come out, Mike James, you know, all the seniors, Von Telemach, Ray Ray Armstrong, they're going to bench way higher at 225 in reps. They're going to be way more impressive. Uh, you're going to have guys that uh, are, are coming out and looking a lot stronger. I think they're going to be faster. They're going to be more uh, hardworking in those senses and those workout areas, and that's just going to be a result of Golden kind of turning things up uh, there at the university. Whether or not that translates to wins or not, you know, the future, you know, it remains to be seen. But the reality of that situation is I think that's going to be the immediate thing that you notice that is different. Scouts are always going to flock to Miami. NFLU is sort of the tag unofficially around, you know, pro scouting circles. So that won't change. But it had the potential, Jamie, and you picked up on this, it had the potential to change if things had continued to go the same way that they've been going. You know, right. guys, look, look at your Corey Harris now. The guy's like 200 pounds. He's put on like about 10 to 15 pounds in this off season, and he looks great. He's huge. And it's like it makes you wonder, all of a sudden, all the chips are on the line. You're huge. You're in great shape. You're snapping the ball. But, you know, where's that been the last four, you know, three, four and a half years? You know? Right. Miami's got a weight room also. You know what I mean? I know you're training out and working hard every single day and doing that sort of thing, but it just makes you wonder if a different kind of coaching staff with different kind of motivational techniques and, 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 a different set of expectations might have gotten a little bit more out of this, you know, some of these well, players. Well, let me tell you, I think that Ja'Cory has a great chance. I, I know a lot of people beat up on him because he's had an up-and-down career, but you go into that last game against Boston College, and he was completing 65% of his passes. His interception ratio was 19 to 5 to touchdowns. I mean, he granted uh, Boston College was a meltdown, but it was a meltdown for a lot of reasons not just to Corey. And I think if a team picks him up as a late, late round pick or even as a free agent, they might have, they might have a diamond in the rough because he did have his moments. So is he going in, guys, is he going in as an athlete or is he going in to the NFL in, into free agency? Because that's where, that's where I'm projecting him at. Is he going in as a quarterback? Oh, he's going as a quarterback. I mean, he, he doesn't, he doesn't translate to any other position. He's six foot three. He's lean, but he does have a great arm. He just has been erratic, and but he's had his moments, with, particularly under Whipple, where, I mean, he had some incredible games. And if somebody can just be a little bit patient with him, give him a little professional tutelage, who knows? Right, right, and that's good. So, you know, and, and that's a good point. You know, this is a kid that gave four years to the university. Obviously, his sophomore year, there was talk, so Heisman talk. I remember the Georgia Tech game where – you know, they blew out Georgia Tech at home. That was a great win for the University of Miami. And then it, signed, it seemed a little bit taper off. And, um, you know, the thing that we – what we will do is, um, you know, look at, at the University of Miami and say, you know, you can always do the what if, right? And I think really what you think about at the end of the day is, is that Ja'Cory, you know, Ja'Cory was a good player. He had a tough go. Um, obviously, you had you know three offensive coordinators in four years. That's it's very difficult for a quarterback, and obviously a lot of things. And of course, the coaching change. So it's a shame that you know it wasn't better. It wasn't the uh, the Cinderella story at the end. But you know that's that's the thing. So we do you know we're gonna we appreciate Brandon, our senior editor at Kane Insider, for giving us some insight today. Uh, Brandon's done a great job to report about Pro Day, and we thank Brandon for that. And he'll be back shortly with us. Uh, thank you, Brandon, for that insight. And, and so, Blaine, this brings me to the conclusion for today. Um, and, Brandon, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I thought, okay. I thought you were actually signing off. But, uh, uh, go, you know, if you have anything to wrap up, I know you need it to head off. But uh, go ahead and, and any more insight into that Jacory Harris. Brandon, Brandon, what about uh, – do you have any impressions of uh, the spring practice so far? Have you been able – uh, to get out there and and, uh, and view the practices. 
Yeah, I, I'll give you that and uh, the Ja'Cory Harris uh, piece, and then uh, uh, I'll log off for a second and join you toward the end of the show. Basically, spring practice opened up last Saturday, March 3rd, here at Green Tree Field. Uh, you know, shells, well, pretty much helmet and, uh, you know, jerseys for the guys. They came out. Uh, Stephen Morris, of course, is the, is the guy that a lot of people are focused on, the fact that he will not be participating in the spring workouts because of uh, uh, a back injury. Uh, Kane Insider has a little bit more insight on that. If you sign up for our Insiders board, uh, we can go into greater detail there. Uh, but the reality of that situation is he's basically Coach Morris. He's calling plays, taking mental reps, but for all intents and purposes, he will not be on the field throwing and participating in spring practice. Ryan Williams is the transfer from Memphis in, the redshirt sophomore. He looks pretty good by all accounts. The freshmen are being freshmen. Uh, as you know, they don't know the offense. They're still learning. They're making freshman mistakes. At the wide receiver position, everyone's getting excited about Rashawn Jenkins. Uh, an offensive line, a guy you haven't heard too much from probably since 2010, is Jermaine Johnson. He's a guy that's come on. He supplanted Chantrell Henderson, who was suspended this past weekend uh, for uh, violation of team policy. Again, if you want to know more about what that could potentially be, the details of that, log on to our insider board. We have some insights there. Reality of the situation, guys, is that, you know, spring practice is underway, and it's just that it's spring practice. We don't get a chance to see it as media members. We get the chance to see 15 minutes off the top. So we're not really sure what's going on, but by all accounts, there are a couple of guys who are standing out, and I just mentioned those. To the J-12 thing, and then I'll sign up for a second. I'll just say this. Um, you know, Mel Copper, all those guys, they projected him not to get drafted. He's definitely a quarterback. The reality is he had humor when he was asked about it, about Mel Kuyper's projection uh, that he wouldn't get drafted. And he said, hey, when I was a sophomore, Kuyper had me going in the second round. Now all of a sudden I'm not going to get drafted. So the reality is he basically pokes fun at Kuyper and says, basically saying it. He didn't say this, but I'll say it for him. Kuyper, you know, he, he, he doesn't really know what he's talking about. There's no way he can be sure, and no one can. Until April comes around and the draft turns on, the reality of the situation is we have to wait and see uh, where these guys, in fact, go. He thought he had a great day, and by my account, he looked as good as I've ever seen him. As you pointed out, he had a great career this year, a great season this year until the Boston College game. That really put a, a, a damper on his entire season, but I don't think it took it away. He looked much better under Jed Fish. The guys had three or four offensive coordinators, and his chalk talk really showed that he could play in any offense, and I think that's one of the strengths of him, and, and coming in as that scout team quarterback or potential third or second-string guy, it could be a scenario where he could be valuable. Well, you know what, Brandon, we really appreciate your insight as being a Kane insider. It's nothing better than that. Obviously, being on the field and not reporting from a studio somewhere in cool air conditioning. So let's, you know, ladies and gentlemen, let's thank the senior editor of Kane Insider, Brandon Adoy. Uh, he should be back later on the show. If you want to speak to Brandon, please call in. Feel free to call in any time at 323-784-9696. Thank you, Brandon, so much. And we'll, we'll look forward Thank to you, you Brandon. coming back on the show. All right, guys, I'll see you in a little bit. Okay, right. talk to you soon. Thanks, Brandon. So, anyways, with that said, obviously a big day at the University of Miami Green Tree Field. And, and, and Blaine D., you know, some guys that come to mind that I think about, and, you know, we didn't get a chance to go out there today, so I hope to ask Brandon later, a guy like Sean Spence. Reminds you of a guy, if you're a Dolphin fan out there, reminds you of a guy named Zach Thomas, number 54. A lot of heart, undersized, um, something that he's just not known for the bench press, uh, the quickest guy in the world. But, man, does he run sideline to sideline and, and, and stuff like that. You root for those kind of guys. And I just want to get your thoughts on, on, on Sean Spence and kind of what the word has been out so far about him. Well, you can't coach instincts, Okay. And one thing Sean Spence has is instincts. He plays with great anticipation. The concern with Sean Spence is his size and how it may or may not uh, affect him going into the pro level because they're looking for kind of prototypical size in their inside linebackers of, you know, 235 and up, 6'1", you know, 6'2", height. And, uh, you know, Sean Spence is, is smaller. But, you know, Something you had touched on earlier in the show, which is Kane draft picks, and they always do better than what you think. I mean, there's just 
one name after another that you know didn't didn't do all that well, let's say as a, as a college player like Greg Olson, for example. But then these guys come out of nowhere and they're always good pro players. So right. how does I- that- yeah, it reminds me of John Beeson, right? A guy that was drafted, surprisingly enough, in the second round by the Carolina Panthers. And nowhere would you ever think he was in the same lineage as a Dan Moore did going to Carolina. So I, I, I totally agree with you, but please continue. Well, the, the point is, is that, you know, I remember a couple of years back, Calais Campbell. Everybody said he was an underachiever at the U, uh, but he had great size and potential. And now this guy is like a major cog with the Cardinals. And right. it just one player, I mean, the, the, I guess the most classic one is Devin Hester, you know, where he, he went in the second round and he was sensational, but he's probably the best uh, kick returner, punt returner in the history of the NFL. So where do you have, if you look at a guy like Sean Spence, and it's, it's a great example of what you talk about, you can't coach the instincts. Do you see him playing linebacker? And, and where do you see him, you know, what, what linebacking position? Because obviously the middle linebacker, you know, again, going back, referring back to the Zach, Zach Thomas example, I mean, that guy was just, he was just, he had so much grit, he could work through it. Do you see Sean Spence, well, Sean Spence playing? First of all, do you see him playing linebacker and where? And if not playing linebacker, obviously you're looking at him as a strong safety then? Yeah, I mean, he, he could project a strong safety or he, I see him as a, as a linebacker. Uh, that could, you know, could play in the, uh, in the, uh, three, four, you know, where he's, uh, sharing an inside linebacker duty. I don't see him as, a, you know, the, uh, sole middle linebacker in a defensive deployment. So, uh, I definitely, uh, I, I see him there. I see, let me tell you something. I am just getting chills from what uh, Brandon said about Travis Benjamin. I mean, it right. sounds like this kid is a home run hitter. We saw it. We saw it at, in, in, in the college level. Yeah. He's, he's diminutive. He's, he's undersized, but he really has – not only is he fast, but he's football fast. You know, he's not right. track fast. He's football fast. And that's a, that's a real – I'd love to see it. For example, I'd love to see the Dolphins take him. I mean, what would be yeah, wrong that, with that? Pick, up, pick him up in the second or third round. Yeah, you know, the thing is is that you look at a guy like Devin Hester who's cha- literally changed the game from a field position standpoint. It's so important in the NFL – when you think about that, and when you got a guy like uh, when you got a guy like him, he is he is so fit for that to position his team potentially his team in, in great field position, and that's some really some great stuff. Um, so if you're interested in calling into the radio, it's Jay Miz and Blaine D on Kane Insider Radio. Our number to call in is three two three seven eight four nine six nine six. Again, Blaine D and Jay Miz now taking over Kane Insider three two three seven eight four nine six nine six. So along the lines of a big day at the University of Miami, of course, we have college basketball and the ACC tournament and the University of Miami right now playing in the ACC tournament against Georgia Tech. Um, this is a must win for the University of Miami team tonight uh, because, of course, the University of Miami is on the bubble. So word has it, um, they have it where it's we're looking at uh, two wins and they're in. So nothing is a guarantee, but with the extension of the bracket, Going out to 68, Miami has a very good job, you know, good chance of making it. And I, and I have to share this with you, Blaine. I think Coach L has done a real good job, obviously with the controversy over, you know, over their heads, obviously with the recent suspension of Reggie Johnson, and of course the Nevin Shapiro and the coaching change as well. I think Coach L has done a great job with the men's basketball team, and not to speak, and, and not to not mention uh, the women's basketball team, of course. You know, finishing up the regular season with a top five finish, which is unbelievable uh, for for the University of Miami. But going back to the men's team, big need for tonight to win. Uh, what do you see at the University of Miami coming out of tonight's game? Well, I listen. I I think they're I think they're definitely going to come through. They've been very consistent all year. Uh, I mean, it's very very team oriented basketball. If you look down, up and down the roster with the statistics and the contributions from all the players, you got everybody contributing almost equally. And that's why uh, I believe a, a team that doesn't rely on one or two go-to guys, that's the kind of team that generally makes it further along when you get into, like, the uh, tournament t- 
type of action at the uh, in the postseason. Uh, if you looked at the way uh, the Miami basketball team has stacked up, you know, quite frankly, nothing particularly jumps out at you. But I have to say that uh, they have a very good defensive philosophy, and they play right. great team defense. And if you look across the board on shooting percentages, I mean, they're just – if you had to pick one area why they're, uh, you know, uh, as successful as they've been this season despite not having the, the quite a quote-unquote star guy is because they play really tenacious team defense. Yeah, you know, you look at the University of Miami this year, and, and what's different from the Frank Hates regime is is that you find that they're very aggressive to the basket. Um, their outside shooting play with Durant Scott is obviously big for them. Um, you know, he's come up big at times. You, know, you mentioned earlier about them being able to distribute the ball equally. You're looking at it from a minute perspective. If you look at the top four, you know, their top five guys, each guy is playing around anywhere from, you know, close to 27, 28 minutes out of a 40-minute program. You also have, you know, four scores in double digits. And then you have probably a rotation going three to four guys in, playing a lot of minutes and contributing. I think the University of Miami, what they need to do tonight, if they're going to play, continue with that approach, the most important thing for them tonight is hitting at the charity stripe. Um, if you remember a couple of games back against Florida State, uh, three minutes to go, and they were up by 13, Coach Hamilton, uh, former University of Miami men's basketball coach while they were in the Big East, and Coach Ham, I will give him credit, he actually took Miami to the Sweet 16 many years ago. Uh, believe it or not, Canes fans, the University of Miami men's basketball team did make the Sweet 16. And if you looked at him, he played a philosophy of, okay, we will change for every two free throws we will give you, we will shoot threes. And at one point they came back and brought back, the, you know, they were down by only three by because the University of Miami continued to fail at the charity strike. And so what do you see, what do you see differently building up to this game? What does Miami have to do besides improving their free throw percentage uh, against Georgia Tech tonight? Well, I mean, it's a matter, it's, it's actually a, a game of matchups with, with, uh, with Georgia Tech because we're not the tallest team by any means. And, uh, I guess you'd have to say we're not the fastest either. So what has been our strength and continues to be our strength throughout the season is unselfishness and uh, the ability to distribute the ball evenly and get equal contributions, uh, scoring-wise, assists, rebound-wise, from the guys that, you know, that have been doing it all year. We just, you know, you're just not going to depend on one guy carrying us. And, and I see that if we play our game, and we have an equal distribution of effort and result, I think we're going to be uh, – there's no reason we can't be victorious. Right. And so you like them with the win tonight. And so the University of Miami will be taking on – this game is at 9 o'clock tonight, ACC tournament. It's the last of four games today. And it is a big must-win situation if the University of Miami men's basketball team wants to play in the AC, you know, continue on in the ACC tournament and obviously go dancing in the big dance. So with that said, there was that's some good news. Obviously some more news on the University of Miami front. We also have Canes in baseball, and obviously a tough, tough weekend against their rival University of Florida Gators. Uh, the Gators have won 11 straight over the men's baseball team, and uh, that is very difficult because if you look, it seems as though they have been the nemesis um, – Time in and time out for the University of Miami, both in the regionals and regular season. I don't know what it is, and I can't put my finger on it. Uh, Coach Morris, I mean, he's had his doubters recently, which is pretty surprising. So, yeah, what, what's your take on the you know on the baseball team and and its struggles against University of Florida and and what they're looking at so far? Well, I mean, you know, I go way back. I go back to uh, Coach Bertman. You know, <laughs> you know, I've been following. Canes baseball forever, and we've had just a wonderful tradition. And we're always, it seems like we're always money when it counts the most at the end of the year. How many times have we, you know, put the, through the impossible uh, but winning game, in, you know, in, in in Omaha? I mean, it's just, it was just so many years we've been doing that. And, you know, things are a little bit different now, but, you know, it's a matter of, of deciding you're going to, you're going to get over this nemesis thing. I mean, I don't know about you, Jay Miz, but, you know, we got to be Florida. We got to, you know, we got to knock them out. Okay. Yeah. Once you get, you get over that, uh, 
you know, you get over that hurdle, that mental hurdle, you know, with this type of thing, then, you know, everything else, every, everything else flows. And I, I just see, you know, Coach Morris is, you know, he's a more of a laid back guy. And, uh, you know, but he's got to, he's got to like say, guys, you know, let's just take this incrementally, but we got, we got to whip those gators huts. That's it. From there, I think everything else will be fine. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, the University of Miami has bounced back. Obviously, they had a you know win. They played the Marlins in the in the exhibition game, and that was a tight ball game. You, you always like, um, obviously, with a cane player such as Gabby Sanchez giving some uh, some tutelage to the young kids and being able to share it to them. Gabby was a great player for the University of Miami, and obviously a great player for the Marlins, and probably a lot of excitement. Obviously, getting to play the actually the first collegiate slash professional ball game. I think they played the day before they played at, uh, they played a high school game. So the University of Miami really privileged, you know, the Hurricanes being able to go out there and taking the field against the Marlins, which is always fun. And they, obviously the excitement and the, uh, you know, the, the allure of the new stadium. So that's some great stuff. I like the University of Miami as I posted earlier. Uh, I think this week I, you know, talked about that I have no doubt that, uh, Jim Morris will do it. Um, People had questioned the whole fact of the last couple of years without Turtle Thomas, obviously, over at FIU. And I think it really doesn't have a whole lot to do with that. I think Coach Morris has the right team. They're a young team. And the great thing is is that they got some great pitching with the Alex Fernandez of the world and, and some of those other guys. I think once they figure out their setup and their closer situation, I really like Miami uh, to obviously play in the regionals and super regionals and go back to Omaha. I, I think this is their year. Um, they've had a the last couple of difficult years and again, Florida being their nemesis, but I like them. Yeah. You know, they're going into ACC play after the, uh, I believe next week and, uh, it's going to be pretty interesting. So I definitely like Miami to, to improve their, their chances of going back to Omaha. So going back into, well, yep, yep. And, and so that's a good thing. And so, you know, we are been on the air now for 38 minutes and, uh, we haven't received any callers yet. Uh, but we'd like to go ahead and take your call. If you're interested in calling Kane Insider Radio or blogging about us on KaneInsider.com or following us at Kane Insider on Twitter, uh, please go ahead. Our number to call into the radio station is 323-784-9696. Again, this is Jay Miz and Blaine D., your Kane Insider host. And so, Blaine, we talk a little bit about baseball and what can you not talk about. Obviously, if you're Miami, we'll talk a little pro sports for a minute to talk about the Marlins. Um, the Marlins obviously have um, got the lore of some great players, uh, new coach in Ozzy Guillen, and, of course, the new stadium. So you want to take a minute and just kind of talk about that? That's been the buzz, obviously, in, in South Florida sports right now. Well, this stadium, first and foremost, is incredible, okay? Everybody that's had a chance to be there and, and, and tour it has just – it's just like their 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 mouths are a gap. They're astonished at how beautiful and how viewer friendly this stadium is. And I think that that goes such a long way because when you think back to the Orange Bowl and how special that place was, and it was special because it was a great place to watch sports and it was a great place to sit and watch your team. And this stadium unlike, you know, Sun Life, which has quite a viewing distance from it. And, uh, you know, it just, it's, it's not, it, it wasn't built, per se, for uh, baseball. It's going to make a huge difference to the fan base. And, and the other thing is, is that we can't deny that there's a, a, there's a tremendous majority of Hispanics that live in Dade County. And I believe that, you know, where the new stadium is positioned, it makes it very uh, commuter or driver friendly uh, for the people to go to the games. And Hispanic people have a passion, an absolute passion for baseball. And now with a, a stadium that's, I guess you'd have to say it's sort of in the heart of Little Little Havana. Yeah. I said I I I I think it's I think just that alone is going to be a tremendous boost to the uh, morale of the team. The excitement, the motivation, and and to get better play out of the players this year. Well, you know what's interesting is Blaine, and and you know you think about it, it is, is you know, and again it ties back into the whole thing is it's the former Orange Bowl site, and um, 
you know, for me, it's going to be a little bit different. I, I've enjoyed some great games, obviously going to Dolphin games, as you have too, uh, from the, the AFC Championship in 1982 to some great Orange Bowl games with the University of Miami beating Nebraska, um, the, you know, the epic game in 1983, which obviously marked the program and the history, as we know today, under Coach Schnellenberger. And, of course, you know, now it's a baseball stadium. And so, you know, it's always the hopes of the fans that one day – the Canes may play a football game here, uh, whether it's a spring game or actual live game. And it'll be interesting from that perspective how it works out. But hopefully the Marlins continue, you know, um, with the players that they have, they have some, you know, they have success this year. And, of course, we only wish them well at the new stadium. Again, there's a small designation. I believe there's a, a somewhat of a, a, uh, a symbol of the former Orange Bowl site. And uh, Canes fans can obviously, as a Marlin fan, can pay homage to it. So we got some great news, Blaine. I just got word our senior editor from Kane Insider, uh, Brandon Adoy, is back on the line. Brandon, are you there? Hey, guys. Hey, Brandon. How's it going? Hey, Brandon. Hey, good, uh, Jay Miz and Blaine. Uh, uh, it's been a great show. And, and before I get back into it, I, I just want to, first of all, um, officially welcome you guys to the Kane Insider family. And uh, we're we're just so delighted to have you guys and cranking back up with Kane Inside of Radio. And what better time to do that than pro day and spring practice? And uh, it, it's really good stuff. So we really welcome you guys with open arms. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And talking about the schedule, and, and guys, if you're wanting to call in, and obviously don't be afraid, this is all about you, the fan. Please call in at 323-784-9696. Tweet us on Kane Insider or find us on Facebook. Uh, definitely, we have some great insight. And our senior editor, Brandon Adoy, here with Kane Insider. Brandon, thank you for coming back on the show. We were actually talking about, you know, the University of Miami, and obviously now and you bring up a good point with the uh, spring practice. Uh, we talked about the ACC game, the tournament coming up to, earlier um, later tonight at 9 o'clock against Georgia Tech, and obviously that's a big deal for them. Uh, one thing we definitely want to talk about is the upcoming practices. Um, you know, practice in, in college football is a lot different than in the pros. This is not quarterback's camp. This is to get kids that are freshmen or have been redshirt freshmen now getting in, them into the fold. We obviously have a pretty large class that is departing, whether they're underclassmen or seniors. There's a lot of uh, 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 spaces to fill. You obviously have the injury to Stephen Morris, and I'm, I'm looking for your insight a little bit. I, I haven't heard anything yet with the Ken Dorsey uh, comparisons to Ryan Williams just yet, but you know, you obviously you have the physical stature, and and obviously there's going to probably be a lot of hype. Reminds me of the 2000 season um, when Dorsey got his chance with Kenny Kelly being hurt. So you know, why don't you talk us through? Obviously, we got some dates coming up with the spring break coming into play. Obviously, today being media day, I think the first practice back is Tuesday, on March 20th, and then of course we have the the scrimmage at the Ken Hendrick Stadium in Hialeah. Ted Hendricks, the Mad Stork, and Blaine probably – actually, Blaine, I don't know if you played with him in high school football, but probably yeah, very – Yeah, I kicked you know, his butt. <laughs> very well. Hey, listen, Blaine. Brandon, Brandon, I just want to interrupt you for a second. I just want you to kind of – if you can capsulize the perception of this time last year with Al Golden and the state of the uh, – of the, the state of the, of the Hurricanes versus this year with Al Golden and and see well, and see what your perception is. Well, Blaine, I'll, I'll get to your question first, and then, Jamie, I'll get back to yours. I really cannot say, because I was not a lot around last spring, covering as a beat writer. I uh, was doing – I was freelancing at the time for Kane Insider, but didn't come on board uh, fully until about July. So, but from what I heard, all accounts, Blaine, is that – you know, being the new guy, Golden didn't really get a chance to really um, sort of uh, put his meat hooks into this program as he has done now. And then the other thing I know his staff was very busy with last year is a lot of player assessment. And then they went out and did a lot of roster acquisitions. They went out and got Ryan Williams. They got Mike Williams from Wake Forest. I mean, Golden, when he talks about this, is reflective. And he basically talks about this, and we had to go and do X, Y, and Z. So he's saying, listen, last offseason, I didn't get a chance to do any of the things that I would have liked to do. I was so busy. Uh, I showed up knowing at this time 
the following year, I was going to have only one quarterback because he knew that Spencer Whipple was gone. He knew that uh, Ja'Cory Harris would be leaving, you know what I'm saying, and he had nobody else in the pipeline. And he, he just thought that was absolutely scary. So he went out, he got Ryan Williams to transfer, you know what I mean? He went out, he got a fifth-year guy in Mike Williams to come and play, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and provide depth there. So I think that even though I wasn't here, I can tell you, it probably was nothing like this because now uh, Golden and his staff is much more focused on player development than actually trying to field a team, you know, of, uh, you know, 85 players. So that's the first thing. And then, Jaden, is I believe you were asking me about spring practice and what we can expect in the calendar and things of that nature. Well, obviously, practice, the third spring practice was today. They're doing like three a week. They started out on the third. They practiced again on the fourth, which was open to the public. And then they practiced the day there was no media availability. They'll be off for spring break from the 10th to the 17th, and then they'll resume the week of the 19th. And that Saturday they will have the Ted Hendricks scrimmage. The following week on the 31st they'll have a scrimmage on Friday night um, over in Fort Myers, and it's getting a lot of praise from people around the South Florida area because that's a big recruiting hotbed that uh, Miami wants to, to sort of start to own. So that's what you can look forward to. And then in uh, April, of course, will be the spring game uh, on the 14th, and before that, another scrimmage uh, here locally. So it's a scenario where they're going to do 15 practices. They're going to spread them out, uh, do about three a week over the course of about four or five weeks. So so that's kind of the spring uh, motive. I guess you could say it used to be spring practice. They get all the practices in with two weeks. Now you're seeing programs kind of stretch this thing out. And if you're down here in Miami, you can really do spring practice as early as you want because weather is generally not a concern. Brandon, what thing. about this? What about this kid, Duke Johnson? I mean, this was like one of the prize recruits that we picked up this year. And you know, his his skills are almost they're almost stuff of, of that are legends are made of. I mean. What is your impression of what this kid potentially could bring, uh, you know, to the to the team in terms of, uh, you know, obviously Lamar has left and Mike Johnson, excuse me, Mike James is, is not a burner. He's more of a pounder. What is this, I mean, this Duke Johnson all about? Uh, Duke Johnson is going to bring a lot. I, I've seen him play here locally in Miami at Miami New Orleans. Of course, they won a, uh, a state championship uh, on their classification level this year. And, I think he's a guy that's probably a year away. And I'll say this, he's not as big as he probably needs to be to be as effective as a running back. Could he be a change of pace guy like Eduardo Clements was? Yeah, he could. Uh, but I really don't see him getting a ton and ton of carries. I think the core, uh, the, the core running back group is going to be, uh, between Eduardo Clements and Mike James with James being more so of the guy. James is pound for pound the strongest guy on the team, according to Coach Andrew Swayze, who said that last Saturday when we talked to him during the media availability. And I think he's sneaky fast. I also think Clements is a lot faster and quicker than people give him credit for. He was the third down back toward the end of the season last year, which means coaches trust him. He's going to get more carries and more opportunities this year. I don't think we're going to see Duke until uh, 2013. Really? So you, do you like them to redshirt Duke? Is that what I'm hearing, Brandon? I don't. I don't think he'll be redshirted. I honestly don't. I don't think you bring a guy like that in and you redshirt him, uh, especially not with someone like Lamar Miller coming back. But I think you're not going to see as much of him as you think. I think you'll see him in, in situations. I think you'll see him. I think the biggest way he'll be used early is on these uh, punt return and these kick return teams. I honestly don't see him doing a lot of stuff in the backfield, especially not having come in right away. It's very difficult to make that transition. He's around the program a lot. Uh, he's always down. Uh, in Crow Gables, I bump into him a lot of time when I'm covering the team, but I honestly don't. A lot of people are saying different. I've got guys who I respect on the beat, Manny Navarro and guys like that who are saying, you know, fourth or fifth game in the season, Duke will be the main starter. I'd be surprised if that happens. Okay, great. Well, listen, we actually have our first caller here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and turn his mic live. Good evening. You're live on K-Not Insider. Who's this? Hey, guys. How you doing? It's Rick calling. 
Hey, Rick, this is J. Miz, Blaine D., and our senior editor, Brandon Adoy. What's your question? Uh, just first of all, I want to say great job, great show, listening here from West Palm. You know, so definitely wanted to call in and um, touch on one aspect or one area. Uh, I wanted to get you guys' uh, take on it, and it's the defensive backfield. Um, you know, how you guys feel about, you know, Ray Ray, uh, Vaughn Telemach. I see that Ray Ray is actually doing such a great job in uh, practice, you know, and wanted to know what you guys feel about the cornerback position with Dion and Tracy and all those other guys coming in, you know, et cetera. And just get your whole take on that to see what are your, you know, feelings in regards to our defensive backfield. Well, Brandon, you want to take, you know, I'll, I'll take a stab at it first. You know, it reminds me of, um, you know, this is a very young team in the sense that they're coming in, but unbelievable upside and talent. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity, I would think, and, and Brandon, and please tell me otherwise, a lot of coaching up opportunity because, again, the high school game is much different playing in the ACC. Uh, starting, although Tracy Howard and uh, and uh, Devin are going to be unbelievable from that perspective coming in. Um, I really like Von Telemach and, and uh, Ray Ray to really take over. Uh, Telemach has probably been, you know, given the you know the ultimative, either get your head into it or or get out. I mean, uh, I would just look at, at Golden uh, the way he handled the situation last year, the way he's gone into spring this year. I really like that, but I, I got to tell you this much. Uh, Ray Ray Armstrong is definitely going to be a big contributor from a senior leader position. Um, he has made it his mission to be that senior leader. Um, I don't know what your comparison would be from the great ones in the past. Is he the next Ed Reed? I don't know if we can go that far, but I'll tell you this much. They have unbelievable upside, and they will be tested early and often. You know, teams like Florida State, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, they have no problem, you know, running big guys at these guys and running them and running them fast. But, Jay Miz, remember we had talked about this? I think there was a little bit of a coaching uh, thing that needed to be corrected. At the beginning of last year, I mean, you watched the early games, and, and, and man, they were playing with huge cushions. I mean, they were backpedaling at the snap of the ball. They were giving the other team's receivers, you know, a 10-yard freeway. And I noticed that, and you noticed it, and it seemed like as the year went on, they tightened up their coverages a little bit better and I think they had better results. So I think it also goes to coaching where you, you have to be a little bit aggressive when you've got these kind of kids with, the, with, that, with that kind of physical ability. I, I would tend to agree. And, and Brandon, I'd like to get your insight on that. Well, I'll just say to that question, which was a very good one, I think uh, about the incoming guys, um, they're going to have some work to do. Uh, but at the cornerback position, they probably have a better chance of contributing right away. Uh, Jay Miz and, and, and Blaine, you guys talked about it. Ray Ray's going to have a great season uh, by all accounts, spring practice. This is the most I've ever heard Coach Golden talk about Ray Ray. He was pretty down on him last year. He would deflect all questions about it. He's now taking Ray Ray uh, full-heartedly. And if he has the same kind of spring, uh, same kind of fall, rather, as he had in the spring, uh, he should be pretty good. Because usually everybody knows he's got the measurables, the size, and the speed but he hadn't put it together on the field. So it'll be interesting to see if he can make that happen. And I expect him and Vaughn to start there in the defensive backfield at safety. Now, at the cornerback position, Larry Hope and Ladarius Gunter are two people who are getting a lot of looks. Brandon McGee is actually behind the board, and I actually saw him today. He's got a little uh, protrusion injury on his right leg, and I don't know if that's hobbling him at all, but he was sort of favoring it just a little bit. It was probably a little bit more than a minor bruise or bang, so I don't want to overhype it. But he's got to climb out of a hole because he's number three on the depth chart right now at his position. Thomas Finney is number one. And he could actually go into a scenario where he doesn't see himself, even as a senior, as a starter. I've watched Tracy Howard play before uh, several times live. He's got the potential to come in and play right away. Will he be a starter? I don't know. I'm projecting him as a nickel package type of guy, but you will see him on special teams. And, and Deion Bush, you don't have to uh, think too much to know. He's going to make an impact, I think, mostly on special teams as well. But those guys will have the opportunity to compete uh, to be the guy on one of the corner positions. I honestly think finish your starter at, at at least one position and then maybe the freshman battle it out uh, with McGee on the other side. So, it, it, it remains to be seen what happens there, but uh, to the uh, caller's question, I believe his name is Rick. 
great question. I think you're going to see a lot of competition for that DB spot. And, and, and as Golden said, you may be wondering, you may be asking yourself, well, how can Brandon McGee not be the starter? He's a senior. He's a leader, X, Y, and Z. The reality of the situation is, and Coach Golden said this on Joe Rose a couple of days ago, hey, he was a starter on the 6-6 six and six team, and that's just not good enough. So there are no spots. As he said in the past, the spots belong to the Miami Hurricanes, the University of Miami, not to a particular player. No, and that's a great point. You know, you think about the University of Miami, we, we have about a little bit over four minutes left on the show, and we have live on our on our uh, show tonight, the premiere show. If you want to call in, it's 323-784-9696. Our senior uh, sports, you know, senior Kane insider editor, uh, Brandon Adoy, and Brandon, you know, one thing I look at the University of Miami this year is a lot of areas in which they look to improve. One thing that's troubled the University of Miami, and I want to ask you this, going into spring ball, and I touched on it earlier, about redshirting. Uh, Blaine Dean and I were talking about this the other day. Is it so very important that you actually have this as you did traditionally in the 80s and 90s, and you had a much bigger, you know, makeup of, of scholarships and, and probably not the opportunity to stockpile players as you do, you know, you don't have that opportunity today. So are we going to see any surprise red shirts? Are we going to see anything surprising coming out of spring ball that will, that will tell us something different about Golden than years past under Coker and Shannon that we should be looking for in these upcoming spring practices? Or are they simply just spring practice adjustments? I'm sorry, was that Brandon? question directed at me? Yeah, that that was for you, Brandon. Oh, oh well, you know, the reality with red shirts, you're never really sure. Um, Dallas Crawford, he was an interesting case, and he's somebody you're going to want to watch. He's playing both running back and, and, and wide receiver in the slot this spring, so they're going to find a place for him. But – we all wondered, man, everybody's talking about this guy, Dallas Crawford, he's going to be a player. And then we were like, okay, if he's going to be a player, why didn't he play? Well, this year, in a separate conversation, but just keeping in mind what I'd heard Coach Golden say before, he revealed that Dallas came in a little out of shape. He wasn't uh, – he was a little overweight. He's lost some weight now. It's a scenario where now all of a sudden he's kind of ready to go. So the red-shirting guy will be the guy that, doesn't come in with his head screwed on straight. Maybe he thinks he was a big deal in high school, not not quite ready for Coach Golden's brand of football. And that's going to be the guy who is, oh, supposedly this great, great player, but he didn't necessarily do the things that it took to get him on the field. And people are going to wonder why he redshirted. And then later on we're going to find out that either he didn't have his head in the game or he wasn't physically right or he didn't want to work as hard. And that's the sort of thing that we're seeing under this golden regime. And there's usually a very good reason for a guy not getting onto the field. But if you're ready, you're going to play. I mean, like Coach Golden said, there's no better opportunity at the University of Miami right now. Right now, spots are available. There's lots of uh, ability to, to get in very quickly, particularly at the wide right receiver, cornerback, and defensive end position. If you want to come in and, and make an immediate impact, if you redshirt at those areas, you really only have yourself to blame. Right, right. And I agree with you. You know what, Brandon, we have a little bit over a minute to go. And real quickly, can you address, you know, I'm looking over the roster for the signing class for 2012, and I see no, and I see a glaring, glaring oversight on the tight end position. It's been such a void the last few few years. Are they just, are they sold on Cleveland? You know, Chase Ford was obviously a big disappointment, moved on now as a Juco transfer. What is it about the university that the Coach Golden, being a former tight end, Penn State guy, what are we? What am I missing here? And looking at this, not signing a tight end to this roster. Well, I, I think you don't need to read too much into it. I know uh, Golden was kind of chided about it in his post uh, signing day press conference, but the reality of the situation is they're going to go after tight ends. Expect them to take two in this class. They've got a lot of tight end depth kind of hanging around. If you think about it, there's Asante Cleveland, who is much improved, dropped a couple of pounds, a lot faster and quicker by all accounts, even Coach Golden. Then you've got Clyde Wofford, who actually got time last year. He'll be more of a weapon. you got Dyron Dye. You've got Perry, David Perry. And then you also have Corey White. You've got five guys there at the tight end position. If you didn't take one this year, the only problem that it really poses is the vertical depth problem. But Clyde was a redshirt freshman last year. He'll be a redshirt sophomore. Uh, Asante's got a lot of time left, and, and, and so do the other guys. White's 
you know, his time's sort of winding down, and Perry's got a few years as well. well so I, it's I not wanna... really an immediate thing, but uh, I think they're good to go, but obviously Golden will be paying attention to it. Well, thank you, guys. Blaine D., Jay Miz, and Brandon Adoy on Kane Insider. Catch us next week.